Hi, welcome. Thank you for coming today. Um, my name is Mai Ishikawa Sutton. Um, you might also know me as Myra Sutton. Um, my talk is called Fighting Cyber Dystopia with Tech Solidarity in the Digital Commons. And let me tell you first a little bit about my background. So um, for five years, I, would, I was with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, it's a digital rights organization based in San Francisco, California. And while I was there, I was with the international policy team, and I was fighting the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement, uh, mostly around the copyright uh, provisions in the agreement. So fighting DRM, uh, fighting the anti-circumvention measures, the copyright terms from getting longer, um, to the copyright takedown policies, to every sort of aspect of how copyright can limit our access to information, um, maybe violate our privacy and security by preventing hackers from being able to disclose vulnerabilities with um, hardware and software. Um, anything you can imagine with copyright that could go wrong was in the TPP trade agreement. And uh, 12 countries across the Pacific were um, going to sign on to it. And it was going to export the worst of US copyright law to the rest of the world with, in any way that they might not already have it. So I was working with the EFF. And while I was there, I realized that it was very, very hard to fight for digital rights and, and uh, represent the public interest when um, the policymakers at the table were all very concerned about the uh, interests of these companies and not interested in the rights of students, the rights of the blind, rights of everybody else, users, hackers, everybody else who um, had concerns with the kinds of policies that these major tech companies and Hollywood and many of these content publisher industry groups were pushing for in this uh, neoliberal agreement. Um, and so while I was there, I sort of slowly had this sort of a lot of reflection about what, um, what it meant to be a digital rights activist personally, because I felt like I was just banging my head against the wall, because no matter how many arguments I made about the impact of copyright um, on things, they would say, oh, well, Hollywood creates this many jobs. It's so good for the economy and all those, all those arguments. So. Um, I started to become aware about another side, another vision for how the internet and technology could work. And that's why I joined this organization called Shareable, which is a small organization that writes about the solidarity economy movement and sharing. Um, sharing uh, revolving around um, tool lending libraries, libraries of course, uh, repair cafes, to uh, maybe blockchain enabled, you know, alternative currencies, community currencies, all these like interesting things where people were sharing access to resources and goods um, with each other um, in a way that was not uh, extractive. So I was there for about a year and then um, I left a few months ago, so now I'm a free agent um, and working on some mesh network projects in Oakland and also um, a cooperative real estate um, organization that we really need in the Bay Area because housing is very, very expensive. Um, and so I come from this from digital rights, um, trade policy, solidarity economy, and the commons movement. So um, that is me. So I think we are here and this audience would agree that the internet is very, very broken. You don't need to, you know, you can look at the news maybe just for one day and see how, the, how it's broken. Everything from, you know, uh, Twitter enabling um, some high profile white supremacists to, you know, harassers being able to just continue to harass people on Twitter so that a lot of people want to leave Twitter, for instance, and then kicking people off who talk about these things on Twitter, to Google having algorithms that are extremely sexist or racist, um, to um, just this past week where uh, Facebook and many other companies were um, testifying at, in the United States to Congress about how Russia was able to buy a bunch of advertisements and pose as real information when it was misinformation. And you know, I don't have the answer to <laughs> how these companies should respond to these things, but clearly there's a problem. Um, but there's one 
story that I think um, is a little bit more local, and um, I'm sorry if this is a little bit US focused. Um, I try to make it a little bit more international, but uh, hopefully if, if you have examples, please come to me afterward because I love to hear them. Um, this example, I don't know if you can see that, is in Austin, Texas. So Austin, Texas is um, in the second largest state in the United States um, population wise, and it is a very conservative state, and Austin is a very liberal sort of state. Um, when I was there, they would call themselves a blueberry in a tomato soup. <laughs> and, um, and so they, had, they have a lot of problems with the Texas state around um, many policies that they want to enact for the city. Um, in this case, they were regulating Uber and Lyft. So in 2014, um, transportation network companies, that includes Uber and Lyft, um, I'll also call them ride hailing companies. Um, these companies um, finally got into Austin after they allowed them to go into to Austin. And then um, for various political reasons, probably partly because um, Austin is a progressive city and also because the taxi industry in Austin was pretty strong um, and because they wanted to regulate these large companies. Um, in 2015, at the end of 2015, they, the Austin City Council voted to create a fingerprint background checks for, for the drivers. So uh, if you are a car owner and you want to join Uber and Lyft, to be able to drive, you had to give your fingerprint um, as a security measure so that, you know, for instance, if you were kidnapped or, you know, there's a lot of, you know, sexual assault ex cases, um, with, um, with Uber and Lyft. So what they wanted to do was a little bit more of a security measure, which was also required for the taxi cab companies. Um, Uber and Lyft freaked out. They, um, so in 2015, that's when the city council voted. And then in May, they wanted to have a vote by the people of Austin to um, overturn that law, to veto the law. Um, and they spent $8 million eight million dollars um, in this local election to overturn this fingerprint background check law. And, um, and I interviewed some people in Austin. They got a piece of mail every day. There was advertisements on the radio, on TV, and it was all about, you know, Austin is trying to choke innovation and trying to prevent people from being able to, you know, share their cars to make a little bit money and also for people to be able to use Uber and Lyft. It was, it, they framed it as this freedom issue. Um, and the Ann Kitchen mode, so Ann Kitchen was one of the city council members that was um, supporting this, um, supported the 2015 law, and um, they, Uber made a special feature on Uber where you can order a horse and buggy, so horse carriage, to order um, in downtown Austin to take you around instead of a car. And they did that to make this one city council member look like she was anti-technology and anti-future. you know, future. So um, it was, you know, they were attacking this one woman on the city council member. And, you know, people in Austin were really upset. Um, there are many people that wanted Uber and Lyft in their city, but a lot of people were like, this is just gross. This is disgusting. Why are they picking on us, Austin? And Uber and Lyft saw this as, you know, um, there's a few cities around the world, like London, um, I believe Tokyo too, where they have regulated these companies to try and balance, you know, the local interests and these large tech companies. And Uber and Lyft protested and left to try and sort of use them as an example, you know, to try and make them look really bad, you know, to make people upset. And it was really just about making an example of Austin um, for standing up to Uber. Um, so then in May 2016, Austin voters totally rejected the law that Uber and Lyft wanted to do, and then, um, and then Uber and Lyft left after, after that. So Austin won <laughs> for a little bit. Um, but during that time, some local alternatives started to come. So um, this local organization um, called Ride Austin, uh, is a nonprofit ride-hailing company. 
So um, it's, if you use the app, it's exactly like Uber, but it's nonprofit. Maybe it's a little bit more money because they don't have you know, all the venture capital money to make it cheap, um, but it's a nonprofit. It's locally owned. Um, they had things like you could have, you can just order a woman driver if you were, you know, just didn't want to deal with a male driver if you're a woman. They had a feature that you can round up a few cents. So if your your ride was like six dollars and seventy-five cents, if you made it seven dollars and twenty-five cents, could go to a local nonprofit. Um, the organization was also going to work with the public transportation agency of Austin to um, expand the availability of you know, handicapped vehicles and also um, to expand the area of the public transportation system. Um, I'll take questions at the end. Um, I, just, I just had a quick one here. Did they require fingerprints? Um, yes, and they, they, yes. So Ride Austin also complied with the local law. So that was a major, yeah, major thing. Um, and um, another one was ATX co-op taxi. Um, so while this was happening, uh, the city council decided to also um, make it make available a new cooperative taxi system so that the drivers could own their taxi um, company. Um, and so it became one of the, the, the second largest, I think, cooperative in the United States overnight. Um, and uh, they had, I think, something like 425,000 membership fees. So you buy into it, and then all the owners own it together. Um, and so it was very, very successful um, overnight. Of course, Uber, <laughs> being Uber, they um, struck back and um, they went to Texas. So they, instead of you know, trying to work with Austin, they went to Texas and lo lots of lobbying dollars, Lyft as well, and um, Austin lost. And so Texas decided to uh, prevent cities in Texas from being able to regulate these companies. Um, I like this example because it's um, an example of a successful situation where people are actually able to regulate a large tech company and then seeing how a large multinational company reacts to that and then to then also see how even though this law, this like fingerprint law might have created some burden, some trouble for tech companies, in the end of the day, there was still local innovation. There was local, um, a local solution designed for Austin, and it wasn't, it didn't really hurt lo you know, local transportation all that much. I mean, I didn't also mention that there's other ride hailing companies that also were there um, that were for profit and they continued to function. So it wasn't a big deal. It was just that these companies wanted to you know, punish Austin. So uh, Douglas Rushkoff is a sort of philosopher thinker about technology. And uh, one thing that I really find interesting um, in his thinking is thinking about how Silicon Valley and you know, the tech industry is all about innovation. We try to make new tools. We try to make life better with all the technology and all the ways that that happens. But when it comes down to the economic incentives and the objectives at the end of the day of these companies, that is not disrupted. There's tech disruption of the tools. There's no disruption of the, um, the bylaws and the, you know, the fiduciary obligations, the, the company needing to make profit for shareholders, um, and that system being a broken system um, in and of itself. So the operating system of the digital economy being broken. And, um, and how is it broken? They're not serving the public good, obviously. At the end of the day, if there are anything, if there's any sort of decision that might cost more to protect users, to protect people's privacy, to give them more autonomy, to be more transparent, they have to make the decision to create, build more profit because that, that's their responsibility, right? Um, and so it, despite you know, companies like Google saying, you know, don't be evil, that ends up being thrown out the window, or at least ignored, pushed aside, if it means that doing the good thing is more expensive. Um, that also means that there's a lack of transparency. There's a lack of transparency around the algorithms, for example, that Facebook uses, that you know, all these algorithms are trade secrets, and so they don't want to reveal how they uh, profile us, because 
then another company might use that, and you know, um, that whole model is how these companies make advertisement dollars and all this. So there's a complete lack of transparency around how our data is being processed, how it's being used, what is going on in terms of all of that. And then also, there's a lack of diversity in the development of these platforms. So um, when the economy is designed this way, when you know, I live in uh, Oakland, I've lived in San Francisco, I hear all this talk about you know, people, my friends who are in startups meeting with venture capitalists who have a lot of money to invest in these companies and the people who have the money to invest in these companies to solve these problems tend to be, you know, um, come from uh, the northern hemisphere, tend to be white men, you know, um, of course, and then a lot of the people who are developers of tech um, are also from this very narrow demographic. And so when you have people who are giving the capital to build these technologies and the people who are building the technologies are very, very uh, limited in their identity, being white male, being English speaking, blah, 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 um, the problems that they end up solving are their problems. They're not solving other people's problems. They're solving problems like, I don't know how I'm going to buy groceries because I'm so busy, or um, I don't know who's going to walk my dog because I'm at work all day. You know, instead of like, how do we, how do we solve problems affecting people who are blind? You know, people. Um, I mean, I just don't even know where to start. There's just so many problems that we need to solve. Those aren't being solved because the money isn't there and the people and the the, the sort of the enthusiasm is not there. And I think uh, it's always important to remember, given this, that tech is not neutral, um, especially when profit and the economy is designed this way. So that's sort of where I came to after this whole TPP um, uh, you know, experience. And what we have now is not working. And um, so this is an image, I don't know if you can see it, is um, Ulysses. Um, this is a story of, of, or this like vignette is him being tied to the mast, tied to the boat because he is going to pass by the sirens, um, these beautiful women that are going to have the, the, the most beautiful songs, right? And they, they will lure you, lure you in. And I don't remember if they kill you or keep you there forever, but he just did not want to get off the boat, so he ties himself to the boat to prevent himself from being able to, you know, he, he preemptively protects himself before he goes into the dangerous zone to make sure that he's not um, tempted. And um, Cory Doctorow last year, this is his whole spiel last year about um, the Ulysses Pact and how, the tech, how technology companies should also do the same thing. They should um, have in their bylaws, they should have in their um, you know, the promise of their technology be that they always protect users. Um, he had a list of them, protect privacy of users, always be able to enable um, people to expose security vulnerabilities with no recourse, so not be, um, uh, what's it called? To not be punished for saying, hey, your software is, is insecure. A lot of companies still, you know, um, uh, punish people, punish hackers for doing that, white hat hackers. Um, so there's a series of things that companies could promise to say so when they're in these dangerous waters where they're you know, growing really quickly and they have to make these compromises and decisions about how their technology is, is designed, they could say, well, we have this pact. We have this pact that we will do things the best way for users um, to make sure that, that people in our, um, our community is safe and more protected. Um, but I also think that um, I think it's, it's, it's a good idea for companies to sort of sign on the Ulysses Pact. I would say that it needs to be a little bit further. So um, that the, the DNA, the operating system of the companies needs to be um, embedded with this Ulysses Pact by be, being democratic, being collaborative, and open themselves. Um, and so what are some examples of that? And there's many these people-centered technologies that isn't shareholder-centered technology. Um, and we can point to a lot of them out there. So obviously, we're all here because we believe in free open source software. Um, the potential of that, or not even the potential, the massive um, 
value that has added to society in just like countless ways. Um, I just chose one example, Limix, which is a example in Munich, Germany, uh, where Munich um, decided several years ago that they wanted to stop paying for um, licenses for the Windows operating system, and instead they um, forked Linux and um, paid people in Munich to develop a uh, operating system for the government. Um, and so that's a great example where they're building public infrastructure from free and open source software and involving the local economy and, lo and local um, population. And obviously you all have probably way tons of examples of that, um, so I won't dwell on that because you all know. Um, there's obviously open knowledge, the open knowledge and culture movement. Wikipedia is an obvious example. It's huge. It's um, it's run by the nonprofit Wikimedia Foundation, which also provides a lot of other wiki tools. Um, and it's maybe the largest wiki, um, uh, encyclopedia the world has ever known. And it's in several languages. It's massive. It's living. It's breathing. Um, it's, it's an incredible example of this platform that is not for, you know, not for profit. Um, the Internet Archive is another one. It's, um, it's also just an archive of many things that are uh, digitized. So I just went to the Internet Archive uh, celebration, and they just got a bunch of film that somebody had in their basement of a bunch of people that were being shipped off to um, the, the camps, um, the internment camps during World War II of, of Japanese people. Um, and they also have, they digitize records, they digitize all these things. They're amazing. And you can access all of this in public domain um, on their website. Creative Commons, of course, oh, um, licenses that enable you to build upon culture. This is uh, an alternative to the restrictive uh, copyright licenses that most things are licensed under. Um, open data, the ability to have um, private but open data that is used for the public good. Um, one example of this is um, in Montevideo, Uruguay. Um, they, they passed a open data policy um, to open up all of the, all the data that the public administration was using. And so they created an app to see how uh, tax dollars were being spent in Montevideo. Um, they created, you know, it's, once the data is out there, anyone can use it. So somebody built an app. Uh, to map every single recycle bin in the city, um, to also show which streets were named after women and not, and it was something like 10% of streets were only named after women. So that's another example of public infrastructure and, um, and data. Uh, secure encrypted communication, of course, like Tor. Um, it is a nonprofit running Tor, and uh, you all know Tor, so I'm not going to go there. But, uh, but it came out of a recognition that having privacy, private communication is a very important aspect of browsing the internet and being an internet user. Um, publicly owned internet infrastructure. Uh, so hopefully it's decentralized. Sometimes it's not. But uh, example is like Gifi or Gifi in, um, in Catalonia, uh, where um, thousands of people have nodes where they are meshing with each other. And it's amazing. It's a, it's a mesh network. So they essentially have built their own internet. It's obviously also connected to the water, wider internet. But it's a way to decentralize um, how the internet is, is built. It's also a way to not rely on a central ISP that may collect your information, that probably you know, um, will have very expensive internet, um, all those things. Um, Secure Scuttlebutt um, is also a new thing. Um, I am new to it, but I know that um, it's a way to have a decentralized uh, social network. Um, I guess it's, it works off of patchwork. I'm not a technologist, so I'm going to virtue this. But um, it's a way to host your content on your own computer and then it uploads it. And then you essentially share this library of your communication on your computer. And it's, it, there's no central server. So it's this amazing way to um, have a lot of people communicate with each other without having a central mediator like Facebook. Platform cooperatives um, are. Um, essentially an app or a website that is cooperatively owned by the users or by the developers. There's an example, Fairmondo, which is a, um, an eBay-like 
platform where people can sell things and you can buy things and it's all cooperatively owned. There's, it's a franchise system now, so there's one in uh, Germany, there's a new one in the UK, um, and it's like eBay, but it's owned by the people who use it. And Stocksy is a photo sharing website, um, or a stock photo website. It was created by the people that used to own iStock Photo. Um, iStock Photo was sold to Getty Images. Getty Images is notorious for being awful about copyright. Um, but anyway, they, they sold it for a lot of money. And then um, a lot of the photographers of iStock Photo were really upset because it was a really good community of photographers. It was known, iStock Photo was known for cultivating the, you know, the photographer community. And then so the founders took the millions of dollars that they got from Getty Images and started Stocksy. And Stocksy is now a photographer owned uh, stock photo image cooperative. And it's international. And um, when they have profit at the end of the year, they distribute it you know, equally to all the photographers. It's awesome. Um, and their photos are actually really high quality. Uh, Lumio is not a platform cooperative, but Inspiral, which is the organization that made Lumio, is a cooperative. Uh, Lumio also is used by many platform cooperatives and many cooperatives, and also um, a, lo a lot of uh, like local governments as well. It's a way for people to you know, uh, have discussions about things and then make decisions. It's a way for people to make decisions in a non-hierarchical way. Um, and you vote on things, you can vote yes, no, you can abstain and say I'm not part of this vote. Um, it's a, and it's software um, to be able to do this. I need to speed up. Um, I added this hackerspace slide after this morning's talk because I think that is also an important thing to cultivate people being able to get involved in technology, learning technology, so that's more democratic in how it's developed. So what do these projects all have in common? Um, they're all in different ways part of the solidarity economy um, where it's not for profit, it's either co uh, cooperative or it's commons based. Uh, it's, it's about meeting needs and it's about people sharing things with each other. It's about humans at the center of this technology instead of having it be profit or you know, making some new sexy technology. It's actually about solving problems that um, people are actually experiencing. Uh, they have community values and needs embedded as core values. If you're a cooperative, you have to be because the people who own it are the people who use it and the people who build it. And so by that very nature of having a different ownership structure of these technologies, you have these, the, the values of the community being at the forefront of, of, of the software. Um, and ideally, not all of them do, but to also um, promote diversity and equity and inclusion in the use of their tools. Um, and I would say too that a lot of these have, um, uh, that their strength comes from the participation of their communities. Even, even Tor, right? When you have more people using Tor and you have more exit nodes, um, it creates more privacy and it's a better system overall. And it, it makes it so that not only hackers and activists and you know, questionable people are using Tor, it just becomes sort of a, it becomes infrastructure, part of the infrastructure of the internet. Um, but that becomes more obvious with like Wikipedia, with platform cooperatives. When you have more people at the table, you build these tools that are more diverse, that solve people's, that address um, various aspects of the technology. Um, transparency and openness, not all of them are transparent and open, but many of them are um, as an aspect of being a collaborative, cooperative project. Um, so what can we do to enable this tech solidarity, this digital commons as a alternative to an internet that is becoming more and more siloed, that is becoming like cable TV where you, know, you go to Facebook, you go to Google, you go to Twitter, and there are these few places where you're sort of, um, you're blocked off it's, it's not really the web anymore because you can't, you're, there's less and less of an opportunity to be able to link things. Things are becoming less open, shareable. Um, and so what, what can we do to support this? It's sort of, <laughs> um, I guess simple, but I think 
maintaining a critical eye, maintaining a awareness that there's limitations around the internet and not to just say the internet is democratizing and, and actually think about how it's not. You know, it's not just about you know, state actors, it's also about the, the very nature of the, the operating system of these technolo technological platforms themselves and how we should think about why these tech companies keep making design decisions that are not designed for users. Um, and secondly, to help build and support the tech solidarity movement. Um, I say, how does your project do this? I think um, there's so many ways you can do this. You can use Stocksy. Next time you want to use a stock photo, go to Stocksy, support this platform cooperative. Um, if you are using Wikipedia, try and contribute an article sometimes and write part of Wikipedia. There's a lot of ways in which these platforms enable your participation. And so by the very nature of putting your time and the energy into them, it makes them stronger. And hopefully, you know, if you have the, the energy and I guess the, the capital to do it to start your own project, but that's, that's a whole other thing. So, I, so, I mean, I, I feel like I've repeated this, but um, the thing is that I think a lot of people are talking about the problem with, tech, with Facebook, with Google, with Twitter, and many of these things. Um, in my opinion, it's, a lot of it comes down to the economics of technology. And obviously this is true for many other aspects of our lives, but I think um, it's much more pronounced with technology because when you have massive amounts of venture uh, funding, a lot of investment going into these internet companies because many of them want to, you know, make a quick return, it, the, a lot of these um, stories of unicorns like Instagram being sold for a billion dollars, these things are this example of, of um, essentially, you know, uh, capitalist, uh, the capitalist economy being sort of on steroids. And it's very quick and it's, it's very, it's sudden, it's a, it's a very uh, boom and bust economy but the people who are losing out the most are us as users, as developers, as, as people who use these platforms rely on them. And so I think thinking about the economy of the technology and recognizing that it's not just this utopian thing that we have this internet that, that actually enables us to access information and share with each other, do all these things that the internet I feel had the promise of actually exist out there with these projects that, some of these projects that I've talked about. Um, and that's it, but I would like to say that if you have examples that I haven't talked about of these tech solidarity digital commons projects that you're working on or that you know about, please share them with me. Uh, I'm a writer, a freelance writer, an organizer, and I'm trying to collect these examples to sort of show that there's this ecosystem that already exists. Um, and I'd love to make them sort of weave that as a sort of um, to show that there is this ecosystem there in place already um, and to add more visibility to them. So yeah, so my email is mysutton at riseup.net. Um, if you don't have a chance to talk to me today, I am on Twitter at Myra. Myra is my real name. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm out of time, but um, if you have any questions, love to take them. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. And I, um, there, none of them are perfect. Like for even like um, 
Stocksy, which is a photo sharing website, all of their photos are copyrighted, you know. Um, and uh, there's also an example in New York. There was a company called Juno uh, that was a company that was giving stock to the drivers of a company. So they, so they were, it was like an Uber, and they were giving stock options to the drivers after you worked for, an, for a year or something. Um, but then they sold to another ride-hailing company, and now all the drivers are screwed. Um, yeah, so with all of these, there's like, it's not perfect. But I would say that it's sort of, we're, it's a push. <laughs> um, and I think, um, you know, I think the, maybe the ideal project would be like a platform cooperative that open sourced all of their software, that licensed all of their content, copy, you know, Creative Commons, you know, um, zero. <laughs> and, um, and was like very security conscious and all of these things. Um, I think by pointing to these examples, we can look at how these various aspects of these different parts of the economy, the tech solidarity, digital commons economy can be realized because aspects of them exist today. So um, I totally hear you. Um, and yeah, I think, I think it's just important to not also uh, you know, shoot down things that are not perfect. I mean, I will also do that too, but um, I think it's important to, sh to show how things have promise because of the way that they worked in their own, in their own way. Yeah, thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. But like, um, I feel like this stuff is really exciting, and I want to see it, it grow. And it's like, it feels like it expresses values that normally you don't get to express in the economy, like solidarity. Like that's something that's reserved for like activism or mm -hmm. art or something like that. Um, but so, are there particular like movements or communities that are doing activity that embodies solidarity that's not really business? That would be that should be a priority to, for the solidarity kind of to connect with. So, like hmm. an activist community or an artistic community or something like. Is there existing communities who are like who would be hungry for this if this way of being economically, if they could hmm. be just be given the tools or connected or anything like that? Huh. That's hard to say because I feel like. Um, the economy is so different in each place. Yeah. And so I also don't think there's like a one solution for everything. Um, hmm. I, think, I, think the major, I think the major issue is that there's a lot of projects that exist, but that um, we're not talking to each other okay. and sharing strategies. Um, I think also, um, Sharing, yeah, like sharing infrastructure too. I just went to that talk by Elizabeth, and I had never thought about the fact that a lot of our like hardware infrastructure and like server infrastructure could be like open sourced, you know. Um, I'm and and so like that sort of thing. Like there's a lot of things where um, the cost could be way lower if we if we shared our knowledge, you know, instead of having to start from scratch all the time. For example, um, in Oakland, where I live in California. There's a nonprofit called the Sustainable Economies Law Center, SELC. They're awesome, um, selc.org, um, or theselc.org. And they have, for example, a lot of example bylaws for companies and cooperatives um, to, to just to copy. You can just download the bylaws, and then you can change it, obviously. And um, they also have legal clinics that show you how to, um, to think about, you know, if you, start a, if you have a grocery store and you want to change into a cooperative, there's this problem right now called the, the silver tsunami in the United States where a lot of older generation people have small businesses and they're retiring and their kids don't want the business. And, and yet a lot of the workers at the business are like um, immigrants or people who, you know, just tend to be lower class. And so there's a movement to sell these small businesses to the workers who know the business in and out. They just might not have the capital to do that. And so, um, and so, so organizations like Selk are giving them the legal tools to help them make decisions together. 
So instead of being like, you know, the board decides for the company the direction um, of the organization, it's the people, it's the users, or it's the, it's the, the workers, or the, the customers, if it's a, if it's a member or cooperative. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but... You okay, yeah, <laughs> so I'm a huge fan of the Selk, um, but I think um, open sourcing even the legal tools to enable these um, you know, platform cooperatives and these other collaborative organizations to exist enables us to learn from each other about how how we even make decisions together. Because that's the hard, that's the most radical thing, is like figuring out how three people, ten people, hundred people, a hundred thousand people could you know maybe be on a on a tech platform and make decisions about how our terms of service is written or you know our the takedown policy or whatever. So. Um, I think that's that like the people side is is sort of the hard part in my opinion. Yeah. Oh, I would like to ask how I, I wonder why why you didn't mention the name of the movement. Oh. I mean, and all, all everything that is related to the internet censor, censorship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, the name of the movement try to tries to avoid. No, I wonder why why didn't you mention it? It, it doesn't connect with. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I would say I didn't mention it, even though it's, a, it's definitely an important value, that I don't see a, like, it's not a project to have net neutrality, you know what I mean? Like, the, the projects that I talked about were to serve some sort of need, like privacy or access to information or something. But, for example, like the Internet Archive um, or Wikipedia, um, they're great about, you know, they, they are very vocal about fighting for net neutrality. So I would say it's more of a principle and more of like a, it's more of like a, you know, like a principle that, 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 these, that these platforms could um, support instead of a, like, a project in itself, if that makes sense. So, I mean, and I think like ideally if, you know, we all owned our Facebook or something, we would say like, you know, hell no, we don't. We don't um, want there to be like tiered pricing for internet services. Like, I think the the project of democratizing the internet would lead to not having to have the discussion about net neutrality. But that's very utopian. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? I'm mean, like way over time, but. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks.